welcome to another podcast about the people and plants of the Bickle Hop Arboretum in Clinton, Iowa. In this podcast, we go a little deeper into the subject of dwarf conifers, more specifically discussing the occurrence of a rarity of what are known as witches' brooms. As we will learn, these are rare genetic growths that can occur for a number of reasons on an already mature plant. According to the American Conifer Society, most trees will have a leading shoot, and that leading shoot will produce a plant hormone known as auxin. This auxin slows the growth of secondary and tertiary shoots that come off of it. This also helps to limit overgrowing by these parts of the plant, which could be a detriment to the tree itself. If there is an interference in this mechanism, it could happen for a variety of reasons in nature, due to solar radiation, viruses, disease, even fungus. In fact, some specific species of fungus actually create witch's broom in specific tree species. If the witch's broom occurs due to a genuine genetic mutation at the growing tip, it will often result in plant material that can be regrown or propagated into a new type of conifer that may be of horticultural value. This is the hope for many folks that actively search out and hunt for these witches brooms in a variety of locations. Their hope is to discover that next interesting dwarf conifer that they themselves and others can enjoy. In conifers, witches brooms most often occur in the Panacea family, more specifically in the genera Abius, which is the fir, Picea, which is the spruce, and Pinus, which is the pine. Just because, though, they are common in these groups of conifers doesn't necessarily mean that you can't discover them in other types of conifers. Often these genetic mutations can result in color variations or distorted variations of the leaves and stems, but often they are also slow-growing or dwarf clusters of shoots. As we will learn, the hunting of witches' brooms can be an exciting hobby for some. It is a hobby that does require, though, a lot of time and patience, since the plant material grows so slowly, and it may take years for a witch's broom hunter to know if the plant material that they found and propagated will result in the dwarf conifer that they were hoping it would. If it does, the person who made the discovery gets the distinct honor of naming this new one-of-a-kind conifer for all the world to know. The addition of various witches' brooms to the Arboretum, some of which were initially discovered on the grounds themselves, along with the rest of the extensive collection of dwarf conifers that is in the Heartland Collection, has given the Arboretum the distinct honor of being recognized as a reference garden by the American Conifer Society. This makes the Arboretum one of only three reference gardens in the state of Iowa. The Arboretum has also had the honor of showcasing this particular collection as well as the other collections during a variety of conifer conferences on all levels, nationally, regionally, as well as statewide. I hope you enjoy learning about these rare genetic distinctions in the conifer group as much as I enjoy talking about them with David Horst, the director of horticulture for the Bickelhop Arboretum. He wanted to have those that were already named and proven throughout the United States, but he also wanted to raise some that they call witches' brooms. Okay. These are kind of experimental plants or mutations that form on a tree and you collect it, propagate it. He wanted to have these and he wanted to have them labeled properly too so people knew they weren't able to be purchased at a nursery. Okay. Uh, they were just kind of in the study stages at this study. point. All right, so why is it called a witch's broom? Well, most of us think of a witch's broom as a broom used by a witch in a fairy tale. Gotcha. According to the American Conifer Society and in a horticultural sense, it's more familiar as a diseased or a mutated mass of dense deformed twigs, foliage forming a bird nest like structure in a tree. Okay. So it's it's brought about most likely probably from some kind of a stress that, that tree has had to deal with, whether that's uh, a stress from disease such as bacteria or virus or stress because of environmental conditions? Right. And the ones we want are probably solar radiation induced or okay. environmental, like you said, mm-hmm. uh, that are actual become genetic mutations. Okay. Because a lot of people don't realize that, that trees also get sunburns to a certain extent. Right. You know, That's that solar radiation that is coming down and hitting them as well. Yeah. They're living things just like us. And so some of those areas, especially if they're new shoots, that solar radiation can cause mutations in the DNA, and thus that those DNA mutations can cause odd growth, like we would call it cancer in some ways, but it's yep. sort of like that, except in a, the tree finds a way to contain it to one little spot. Yep. And that, when you look at that, it looks very disheveled, upheaved, 
Like at the end of a witch's brew, I'm guessing. Right. Okay. And uh, they're not real sure what exactly causes them, but that's one of the main theories. Yeah, there's, and there's a, probably a variety of things that can cause it. That's just, you know, yeah. this one happens to be, or um, you know, many of them, a common reason they come about is because of the solar radiation. Yep. And the reason they think that is because a lot of them, even here at our altitude, what are we, 550, 60 feet? Yeah, between 550, 600 feet, right around in that area. We're right in that area. We find them here in the Midwest, Mm -hmm. but on a larger scale, they are found like in the high mountain areas. Where you're closer to the sun. Eight, 9,000 feet in altitude or higher. You can drive down the road and you can spot them here and there. Huh. Much, much more common. Now, are they also more common in areas where, like, for instance, if, if a tree lost some limbs on one side and we had new growth on that other side because it would be exposed more to the sun, do you see more common in areas like that even? Uh, we haven't noticed that. Oh, you haven't noticed that already? No. No. And we find a lot of them, interestingly, around the Midwest here in cemeteries. And it has nothing to do with the people buried there, I'm no. sure. But it, it's the larger size of evergreens, we believe. Mm. A lot of cemeteries have evergreens that have been growing there for many, many years. Yeah, you know, people die. They, they have this nice, yeah. beautiful spot to, to put their relatives. And they always want to plant a tree there. Yeah. And they always plant, you know, they tend to plant an evergreen because it, it's hardy and whatnot. And after a while, you know, because some of those in some of those old pioneer cemeteries, some of those evergreens are probably you know a couple hundred years old, maybe. Right, and that increases your chances of having a broom grown in them. Just like with age and, and, and people, you know, yeah, it increases your chance of, of, of problems with cellular growth as well. Yep, and I've been very fortunate to have met Chubb in the first place here, but I've met a lot of other top conifer experts throughout the country through Chubb over the years. One of them also is from across the river here, Randy Dykstra. Randy and Chubb, of course, collected witches' brooms for many years. And I was fortunate because they took me along with them. Okay. We'd go out and we'd spend the whole day on a weekend driving around, checking cemeteries, driving through towns, looking for evergreen trees, looking for witches' brooms. So I was very fortunate to get to go with them. And a lot of this happened during the winter time mm-hmm. uh, when they could be propagated. Okay. Uh, so we we had a big pole pruner that reached 48 feet. We just keep putting the sections together. Yep, they were yep, like yep. six foot sections. <laughs> And you had to lean it on a limb because after you got it up about 20 feet, it started getting top heavy. Gotcha. You had to prune her head up yep, on the yep, top. Yep, yep. And of course, we'd weave it up through the limbs to where the witch's broom is and we'd take a snip off. If it was out in the country, sometimes we would use a firearm. And I had those, so I would take that. And then we could shoot a piece off. Oh, okay. We gotcha. never we never wanted to take the whole witch's broom because the genetics would be lost forever if we didn't get any to take. Yeah, all right. Well, all you need on it is a little piece called a scion. Okay. And What's the scion have on it in terms of the plant anatomy? It would be about... Like a node? Yeah, there'd be like a branch node? usually some buds out in the end. Yep. And what you wanted to graft was usually just one or two years of growth. Okay. Because uh, a lot of people don't realize that plants are what we call totipotent. And what we mean by that is you can take a piece off of just about any piece of the plant. If you have the, if, if you subject it to the right hormones and the right conditions, it'll grow roots and leaves and all that kind of stuff, even from whatever kind of a cutting you have. And you can do yeah. that if you know what you're doing. And it sounds like that's what you guys were doing with the witch's room. You were taking just that right piece and finding a way to give it, put it under the right conditions to have it grow and, and give you what you saw in the tree, correct? That's correct. Uh, we didn't really have the proper facilities here at the Arboretum. Chubb had a greenhouse and Randy had a greenhouse and they had some other growing structures too, okay. kind of like cold frames. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they would take the small pieces back. Like I said, we'd leave the entire broom intact mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. possible because if we didn't get to grow, we'd go back next year and collect it again. The genetics were still there. The like genetics are still there, but yeah. once we cut it off, it was gone. Yeah. So Randy and Chubb did a lot of the propagating. They'd propagate it for themselves, for their friends, and also for the Arboretum. Oh, okay. So if I'd go with them and we'd find some plants, they would propagate it and they'd give us a plant or two to plant out in the collection. So it worked good. And a lot of these brooms, when they're found, like by Randy and Chubb, if it was found here at the Arboretum, they would call it Bicklehop Arboretum. Okay. Made it easy to remember where it came from. Yeah. Chubb so kept in the naming process, you would say, okay, this was out at the Smith Farm. So it would be the Smith Farm, which, which is Broom, for instance. Right. Okay. A lot of people did it that way. I did it that way with the white spruce I found here in Clinton. I called it Cleveland Road. Oh, okay. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, a road name or the owner's name that owns the property, mm-hmm. the park. 
yeah. cemetery. A lot of them are named after cemeteries. Uh, so that works good. So over the years, we have found nine of them growing here at the Arboretum. Wow. A lot of them didn't get propagated because by the time we'd find them, they were already dead. The problem with witches' brooms are, remember now, they're slower than the parent plant. Okay. So the parent plant's growing, say, a foot a year. The witches' broom might only be growing two inches a year. Gotcha. It doesn't take many years for the parent plant to cover up the witches' broom because it can't keep up. Yeah. So it's not getting sunlight, and it gets crowded out, yeah. and it dies. I was going to say, it might be a defensive mechanism around the main plant to try and, because again, right. it's, it's not normal. It's, to it, it's to an it, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's like a mole or something you might have on your yeah. arm kind of thing. It's like, now oh, we need to get rid of that. You yeah. Cut things off. So. And two of our most important broom finds here at the Arboretum that have become growing throughout the nation now, collected throughout the nation. Oh, okay. One is Green Twist. And okay. again, Chubb and I came up with the name Green Twist by the foliage on the plant. We found it here at the Arboretum. Instead of calling it the Arboretum or Bickle Hop, we called it Green Twist because it had a cool twisted needle. Oh, okay. And it was green colored. Makes sense. Green Twist. So that's another way they name plants. It's also by the foliage or yeah. the plant shape, maybe. <laughs> too many. Too often I get told by students, oh, why are the names have to be so <laughs> difficult? And that one just yeah. looks like, you, sounds to me like you guys went simple with it. Yeah, that's always helpful. So, and it, the, <laughs> from a marketing standpoint, that's, that's we kept helpful. it very simple, <laughs> and uh, that came off of contorted white pine, which oh, is okay. growing right off the back corner of the building here at the arboretum. Huh. And another one was on a mugle pine right along the waterfall. It was a mugle mops, mm -hmm. and I was working there one day back in 1995, and I noticed something unusual. I couldn't tell if it was a broom or if it had been injured and then shot out a bunch of little growth. I waited a year and it came out dwarf again. Hmm. So then I called Chubb and said that I'd found a broom, and I kept saying, it's really choice, Chubb. I really like it. And he <laughs> said, well, just give me a name. What are you going to call it? And I said, I don't know. You can name it whatever you want. I've never been very clever with the names. So the next time I talked to Chubb, he had named it Dave's Choice. because so it's named after you then. Dave found it, and they then it. I kept saying it was Choice. <laughs> and we also have that plant growing here at the Arboretum okay. with Green Twist. Okay. So the parent plant is gone, but we have the broom. Which means technically, genetically, you still have the genes. We still have the genes, yeah. You still have the genes in some way. And both of them have been propagated throughout the United States. They're, you can't go to Walmart or Home Depot and buy them. But if you go to a collector, you can find them. Oh. And I see they're even over in Europe now. So it's amazing how plants travel. Yeah. And that's good and bad. I mean, good and bad. As long as they're careful and inspected. Inspected, yeah. For because diseases I mean, and from what I've insects. Been, I mean, in terms of the history of this place, that's one of the reasons that this place was founded because plants travel as well as all the diseases like Dutch Elms disease and chestnut blight. Emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer. And so, yeah, we would, we would hate to have Dave's Choice be a vector <laughs> for something we don't want. <laughs> but it is really cool to know that, you know, this thing that you found and you got to name and that is, is you know originally from this spot right here yeah. has has been able to go around and other people have been able to appreciate it and enjoy it and, and like it for the same reasons you did. That's right. That's and very cool. And it's pretty addictive once you find one. Yeah, once you find I can see and where, it, you know, the, the, you know, like this is, you know, nobody has ever seen this. I'm the first one to yeah. discover this original thing in my backyard and yeah. now here we go with it. And the only problem with dwarf conifers is they are a slower plant, which is good. Keep them small scale for your house. Mm -hmm. But the bad part is if you find a broom and you propagate it, it's going to take years and years to know what that shape of it's going to be, the exact color, uh, if it's a worthwhile plant to even keep raising. Uh, sometimes they do weird things. Sometimes they just die for unknown reasons, like maybe they're not all there genetically. Yeah. Uh, and then other times they turn out to be wonderful new plants uh, that may become a new plant on the market. So it sounds like for those people who collect those kind of things and are into the, the witch's broom, the dwarf conifer, conifer uh, thing, patience is a big thing. Patience, and it's a long-term time investment. Yeah, it's not something that you know you're gonna you're gonna know exactly all you need to know about it. You know, within a month or, or a couple months or even a year, it may take yeah. half a you know half a decade. Like a perennial, you can propagate. You can raise it from seed, cross pollinate it, whatever, and come up with a new plant. And you know, within a couple years, what you got. Yeah. But with a conifer, you're looking at 15, 20 years, wow. probably minimum, especially a dwarf. Now, those dwarf uh, conifers, do they put out cones and whatnot? Yes, and 
that's another aspect with finding a witch's broom. Hopefully you can find one that's got cones. Okay. And uh, just like the broom being smaller than the parent tree, usually the cones are also smaller than the normal growing mm -hmm. cones. Okay. Are, yeah. are the seeds in, in the cone viable? Uh, sometimes they're viable and sometimes so they it's, are not. It's, again, it's one of those it's one of those experiments. Yeah. You know, you, you you go with it, you plan it, and you you see what you can do, and if it comes up, woohoo! If not, yay. yep, that's right. And there are people that just collect the seeds and propagate those. Uh, Randy and Chubb used to do that too. They grow flats of them, especially yeah. Randy. I remember going over there, and Randy always said. This is just a rough estimate on Randy's part, but he always said the witch's broom is being pollinated, cross-pollinated with the parent tree by the exactly. pollen, or neighboring, yeah, or neighboring, if they're the same species. Yeah. He always said half of them, on average, are going to be somewhat smaller than a normal seedling, mm -hmm. and the other half are going to kind of grow like a normal conifer. conifer. Okay. So then over time, he starts weeding them out, because he can tell by that seedling after a couple years if it's going to be a fast grower or smaller one. He was looking for the smaller sizes. Yeah. So he starts weeding them out in time. You can't raise thousands of them. you got to be selective. Exactly. So but that kind, of, that kind of intuitiveness takes a whole lot of work and a whole lot of time and a whole lot of patience uh, that a lot of folks just probably don't have when it comes to those kind of things. That's right, because in all those years with those seedlings, you've got to water them. You got to keep them weeded. You got to pot them up to different sizes of pots. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to it. Wow! It's a year round. I was gonna say it's not something that you just put it, you know, just put it in a pot and put it in the corner in the sun and be like, okay, I'll make sure you're watered every once in a while and be done with it. No, it's there's a little bit more to it than that. Yeah. Now, a lot of people also don't realize, like you mentioned, pollen. You know, conifers are not pollinated because they don't have a flower like like. Uh, flowering trees do, like a lot of deciduous trees, they're not pollinated by bees or wasps or birds. They're, it's all wind pollination. And so whatever's blowing in the breeze that happens to hit at just the right time, that's what is going to be the genetics. That's half the genetics right there. That's right. You know, from one plant to the other. Yep. So. so you never know what you're going to get. Yeah, it's, it's a mystery every time. And that's what makes it exciting. I was going to say that that is where the interest is, is knowing that you don't know. You, who knows what you're going to get here from this. Yeah. And that's how a lot of just fabulous plants have come about. So in terms of these dwarf conifers, like you said, they're not a lot. They're not available in like your Walmart or your Home Depot or things like that. You have to go to a collector to find them. And some of them could be propagated by seeds, by the cones. But a lot of them probably are propagations from the original cutting, correct? Correct. Cutting upon cutting upon cutting. Do they do any grafting? Or conifers don't graft real well, do they? Uh, certain ones they graft and others they do rooted cuttings. Okay. And seedlings, of and course. Seedlings, of course. And they are becoming more and more available at like the Walmarts, Lowe's, Home Depots. But still today, the best place, if you're looking for dwarf conifers, is to go to a specialty nursery or a collector. Okay. Uh, people that raise them, just that's all they grow is conifers. Like Dennis Hermson up at Farley, Iowa. He sells okay. nothing but dwarf conifers, wow. for, the most part. for the most part. That's what his specialty is. Huh. Education is at the foundation of the Arboretum's mission. And the Arboretum has the distinction of having the heart collection classified by the American Conifer Society as a reference garden. This classification means that they are known as a place where people can come and learn about a large variety of conifers that can be grown in the area. As you said before, you guys are recognized by the American Conifer Society as the Heartland Collection, and that initially started with Chubb when he was the president of the American Conifer Society, correct? That's correct. And since then, it sounds like you guys are a reference garden? What does that mean? The American Conifer Society came up with this name of reference garden uh, to recognize noteworthy conifer collections throughout the country. Okay. Uh, so in all the regions, they recognize us. They may, like our region is called the Midwest region. Yep, which makes sense. So we're part of that. Uh, I think we were like the third or fourth one recognized in our region at the time okay. in 2012. All right. But it's a way to educate people and to promote conifers. Okay. Uh, so what's involved in becoming a reference? Guy? Having a collection of plants available for public viewing okay and that are labeled okay does it have to be a certain number of plants or is it just as long as they're properly labeled in the correct way and that they can be used for educational purposes you would qualify them as a reference garden right okay so yeah. there's no there's stipulation that you have to have more than five less than so many and things like that no no and i believe there's 51 of these total throughout the country oh okay and we're fortunate to be one of three in iowa oh 
Uh, there's the Iowa Arboretum out at Madrid, kind of between Ames and Des Moines, okay. which is a large arboretum. Mm-hmm. And the University of Iowa, the okay. campus, their maintenance crew has a reference garden designation. Oh, really? I did not know that. They have a wonderful little garden. They're kind of spread throughout the campus, but they have a couple locations where there's uh, denser plantings. Yeah. And then, of course, Bickle Hop Arboretum here in Clinton, Iowa. Wow, one of three in the state. Yep. That's so, a pretty big dis- uh, Pretty big. That's right. Yeah. We're, we're honored. Yeah. Once the collection was established, the work did not stop there. This collection is continually being monitored and maintained, but also added to as new partnerships are made, new plants are discovered, and new beds of conifers are being planted. So as you've been going, you were made a reference garden in 2012, you've been keeping up with the maintenance of the Heartland Collection. What else has been added to the collection uh, over the years? Uh, Over the years, we always attract conifer enthusiasts, collectors. Collectors. Uh, that come here and they collect wood. That was one of Chubb's stipulations when he made the proposal to the Bickle Hops back in 1990, was that he wanted visitors to see the collection, and he also wanted it made available to collectors so they could collect cyan wood. Oh, okay. So and, they can collect samples and propagate it on their own, as long as they do it correctly. As long as they do it correctly. Uh, the stipulation was that they have to ask permission First. Whenever they come. Okay. Yeah. So that uh, we don't have any plants that are maybe small that shouldn't have any cuttings yep. taken. If they're not ready yet or anything like that. Yeah. Because you don't want to damage what you've already got. Right. And they're limited to what they can take. Usually we recommend three to five samples from a plant. Okay. Uh, and that's depending on its size. We don't want a nurseryman to come in and take off the entire top of the plant. No, we wouldn't want that. So uh, we limit on what they can do. With these collectors that come and collect the cyan wood, mm-hmm. the, uh, some from Ohio had come, and a couple were friends of the arboretum, a couple were nurserymen. They kind of gotten a tendency of coming every year. Okay. This was kind of their vacation. They'd come oh, okay. and collect wood, and I'd spend a few hours up with them visiting mm-hmm. and going over the plants. And inevitably, it end up, We'd talk about expansion or what we're going to do in the future, and sometimes they would also donate some plant material oh, in okay. return for yeah. us giving. It was very them. reciprocal. It sounds. That's like. right, very okay. reciprocal. Well, one year back in about fifteen or two thousand sixteen, I was talking with a gentleman from Ohio, and he said that he had a proposition for us. He'd be willing to donate some plants. He was a witch's broom hunter mm-hmm. and collected plants from all over the country, especially up in the Upper Peninsula area. Okay. Wondering if we'd be interested in that. So, upon a couple years of thinking about it, we came up with the location on the top of the hill, which is right after you walk into the collection. There was an open lawn area there. Oh, okay. This gentleman and his wife donated 160 plants. Wow, that's a pretty nice donation. Yep, Randy Dykstra and I from Fulton, we drove out to Ohio and picked them up. He donated all of them, and with the future promise, he's going to continue donating in the future. Okay. Randy and his wife Karen from Fulton uh, have donated quite a few plants also, so we thought it was only appropriate that we call this new area the Barger Dykstra Collection. Okay. And that's how the name came about. That's how that name of that little part of the collection. And it's still part of the Heartland Collection, correct? It's just like a subset? That's right. Okay. And both Randy and Bill Barger were good friends with Chubb. Okay. And we know sense. Chubb would be thrilled today. Yeah, if you were still around today, he'd be thrilled with the fact that you guys are expanding and you're adding new things and you're still keeping all that enthusiasm and that education and that camaraderie about the whole collection up and going. Yep, and a majority of the plants that have been donated by the Dykstras and Bargers have been witches' brooms. Okay. Which is also neat and ties in with Chubb's request at the beginning. He wanted some of the collection to be witches' brooms. Okay, so it sounds like it all works out sort of in the end in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so are there any future collections in mind or are you just kind of at the moment waiting to see how things go? At the moment, we're waiting to see how things go. We're out of room now for the collection, so now we're kind of in the maintain mode. Yeah. There will be some more donations from the Barger Dykstras because as they get growing in that area, that was in 2018 when we started that. Some of the plants are growing a little faster than we thought, so we're mm. going to start transplanting some of them while they're still small enough to out locations. to the larger areas. Yeah. And that'll free up space to get some more new plants that are miniature from okay. bargers and dykstras. All right. Often, with many disciplines, people like to gather and discuss the latest trends, new research, or showcase projects that are near and dear to them. The American Conifer Society is no different, and they hold annual meetings on the national level every year, along with regional and state meetings as well. 
these meetings allow destinations such as the Bickle Hop Arboretum to showcase all the hard work that they have been doing while also participating in an educational event that can benefit people on all levels and from all parts of the United States and beyond. As David explains, the Arboretum has been very fortunate in being chosen on a number of occasions to host these types of events. It sounds like, as a part of the American Conference Society, you said they have what, you said they have annual meetings every year. They have annual meetings uh, at the national level. They have a national meeting, okay, which we were hosting until COVID changed our plans. Oh, so we were going to host it here at the Arboretum. We were hosting it here at the Arboretum and at Clinton Community College. And Clinton. So, what's involved in one of those national meetings then, in terms of, of logistics and, and what that means for an Arboretum of this size? Well, we were going to be the host garden. Okay. So our heart. And collection of dwarf and rare conifers was the featured collection. Okay. And then there would have been four or five other tours. Okay. Uh, most of these were homeowners mm-hmm. that collect conifers. Okay. They would tour those homes. Down at Clinton Community College, they were going to have a series of classes and lectures. Okay. That lasted for a couple days. For a couple days. So you'd have a couple days where you'd have lectures and classes on conifers, on maintenance, on pruning, on propagation, on all that kind of stuff. And then on some of those off times, you guys would then take tours of various collections, this being one of the main ones, but other collections in the neighborhood also were, were lined up to be given tours of. Right. Here in Clinton, Fulton, uh, one of the tours was out on a farm by Elvira, and then there was a couple tours down at uh, McCausland, Geneseo, and Moline. Oh, okay. So and that's a, that was a national conference. That was a national conference. That's the first time we ever hosted a national meeting, mm-hmm. or would have, would except, have except for the COVID. For if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Yet. And <laughs> generally, 250, 300 people attend these, and they come from all over the country, mm-hmm. sometimes even from other countries. Wow. Sometimes Britain, uh, some of the countries in Europe, some of the serious collectors come. So they just have, like, one national conference a year, then? One national meeting a year. One national meeting. Do they have any regional ones? And then the, each region has a meeting a year also. Okay. And usually they switch it up. This year it might have been like uh, in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, next year it could be Indiana. Okay. The Arboretum has ha- actually hosted a couple of the regional meetings over the years. And it's probably, come, uh, probably a similar format as the national ones, just on a smaller scale. Right. Right. So you, you do some lecturing, uh, some presenting, and then touring of various locations so people can see in your little part of the region what we're doing compared to other parts of the region. Right. And then uh, the next level down would be like the rendezvous, they call them. Oh, yeah? And each state can put those on. Oh, okay. And I believe last year was the 21st year of the Iowa Garden Rendezvous, which we hosted also. Oh. Where they didn't have the national meeting, they decided to have the Iowa Garden Rendezvous. And it's AC members, American Conifer Society members mostly, but anybody can attend. Oh, okay. And it's a lunch, and then you tour gardens again. Wow. So we were on that. You were on that I, list. I believe well. that might have been the second or third time we okay. were on that. So it's a nice way for the these these sort of national, regional rendezvous type meetings are good ways for to get other people who may normally not come to this part of the state or even the country for that matter and showcase what we really do here. Showcase all the work that's being done, not just in terms of the conifer collection, but all the collections that are here on the on the, the acreage of the Arboretum. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's the hope. Yep. <laughs> and it's worked pretty well. <laughs> Good. That's, that helps. As we have seen, the Heartland Collection of Rare and Dwarf Conifers offers a unique learning opportunity for people of all interest levels, from the scholarly academic to the homeowner who's just looking for that one plant that may be perfect for that difficult-to-fill spot in their yard. This collection also gives people the opportunity to admire rare plants that had previously never been discovered or named until witches broom enthusiasts sought them out. With the collection continuing to be added to and modified, it means that with each new visit, there will always be something new that can be seen in this part of the Arboretum. I would like to thank David Horst for his insight and enthusiasm with this podcast, and to Otis Welch for the musical selection. (laughs) 